Hi, and welcome to Transparent with Tina. I am Tina Marks, your host. So, you know, we've all had those days that we just felt like off, like whatever that was coming out of our mouth wasn't making sense to the other person. We weren't getting our point across. We couldn't get them to understand the service that we were providing to them and for them to see the value. Well, you know, and also take it even a step further, you know, because our thoughts are things and whatever we think about does transpire and manifest in our lives. So, you know, a lot of us don't think about that. We think about, well, you know what, if we study the script long enough, or we know the value of something enough, we're going to be able to get it across to somebody. But you know what, it's not that simple. And today's guest is going to show us patterns and things that we can do and ways of conversing and communicating more effectively so you can get your message across, not come across as salesy, which, you know, my clients, the number one objections I have from them is they don't want to come across as salesy. And I get it. Who wants to come across as a salesperson, right? You know, but you do want them to understand the value. And one thing that we discussed today was that we both agreed upon was, you know, I think that we've all been taught it backwards that, you know, we should first get and then give, but you know what? It's actually the opposite. You know, once you give, then the natural cause and effect is to get, you know, if you're running through life with a catcher's mitt on, you know, it's not a good way to be, you know? So I've found that once you give, you will get back in return and it's just so much more authentic and people do feel that, you know, they understand a lot more than you think you, that you think they understand. So, you know, this way is just an amazing approach to get your point across. So people do understand what you're trying to do, but also let them understand the value of what you're trying to say. And I hope, <laughs> I hope this all came out the way I was thinking about it in my head. Then again, I'm a little ADD and a little unorganized. Um, can help with that too, I think. Anyway, our guest today is a hypnotic influence expert who helps entrepreneurs and business owners close more premium sales by helping them harness the science of positive persuasion strategies to quickly and easily rewrite negative thought patterns. My guest today, Mr. Jason Linnett. Up next. So welcome, Jason. I am so excited to have you here. I've got my glasses on. I can take them off because I can actually read my notes without them. So I made I made the notes that big. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, you know, I'm really interested in your profession. Um, as I had, you know, when I introduced you, you are a certified professional um, um, hypnotist and you're also a hypnotic influence expert. But before we get into that, because I don't really know what the second one means, before we get, you know, I, it sounds, it sounds like everybody's an influencer these days, but um, let's go into like how you got into this business. Like, sure. Yeah. So I let this kind of reverse engineer for a moment. The work that I do nowadays is in one part, working with people for personal change as a hypnotist, Though at the same time, too, people were then curious as to how it all worked and more so entrepreneurs. So kind of peeling back the curtain and revealing how the methods actually work and how we can use that in our marketing, which the same way that people would be fascinated by that is where now going back about 20 years ago, I was in the audience, I was in college, and someone came and did one of those comedy hypnosis shows. And something about that just grabbed my attention and I went... I want to learn what that is and how that works. And this was a cool moment because for people watching one of those shows, if you don't know the people up there, it's easy to go. That's fake. I don't think that's real. Mm -hmm. In my situation, it was a lot of my friends that were up there. Ah. It was that proof of going, well, damn, there's something to this. I need to learn more. <laughs> I remember my dad taking me in LA, uh, the hip hypnotist, Pat something, I think her name, which she was very famous in Los Angeles. But oh, I, Pat he, Collins. That's it. Pat yep. Collins, right? Oh, a small that, community. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember that too. And, you know, I've always, I actually had gone into training uh, to, to do, you know, hypnotherapy and um, 
I just, uh, I didn't make it all the way through the training, but I do believe in the subconscious mind and mm-hmm. what you put in your subconscious mind dictates your actions and behaviors and everything else. So, which I'm guessing that that's where all this is stemming from, correct? In, in some way, yes, there's a bit of an update. I always love to branch off of that word belief that when we suddenly then go to a resource like scholar.google.com, here are tens of thousands of peer reviewed studies talking about just how effective the hypnosis process is. Mm-hmm. Here's the research in terms of neurological studies, brain scans that points directly to this is what part of the brain is activating. Here's what's making it work. So to find ourselves in kind of a newer age where now it's no longer belief, here's just the knowledge of what we have. And the better question is, how do I now put that to use? Right. And, you know, I've been reading or studying a lot about uh, NLP, and this is Mm -hmm. all interrelated, correct? Yeah. So the background for those that don't know those letters, NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. It was at its core a behavior modeling experiment back in the 1960s and 70s, where they were tracking a number of people, some of which were therapists, and asking the question about how do we model what they do and where there were several other people they studied, but one of them happened to be a well-known hypnotist of the day by the name of Milton Erickson. Mm -hmm. Though surprisingly, actually a lot of these language patterns come from some of the other sources. So there's some overlap from hypnosis to NLP, and it's where often people get caught up in the jargon because in NLP, there's one specific language pattern Mm -hmm. called a non-specified referential index. Mm. And you can do the technique a lot faster than you can actually describe the term. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So there's well, this there's almost like swishing pattern. I don't know. I mean, I st- I, I'm in the middle of taking that too. Oh, cool. Tell I'm a little ADD. I mean, start something. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. better at that though. <laughs> hey, nice. I wonder, would, would this help me with, with AD? Does it help with ADD? Well, I'd say there's always the disclaimer of saying as a non-medical person, I'm not treating or diagnosing a specific condition. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, if it is what I got my start with of doing the personal change work, the question always starts instead with going, well, what are those specific things you would like to do better? I mean, even going back a bunch of years ago, here's the adult who's I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm in Springfield, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And if I ever had a client back in the day for test anxiety, it was very rarely a kid. It was most often, here's the government contractor who had to now get certified so they could prove they could do the job they'd already done for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yay, bureaucracy. And Mm -hmm. so often, well, I've been diagnosed with this. I'm like, okay. And how would you rather feel though when you sit down to that exam? And that's what we worked on. We worked on that solution rather than that label. So in terms of personal change, I always say, you know, ask yourself first, what's the thing you want to do better and work towards that rather than, well, because of this, the short version of this is the word because could be the most dangerous word. It could also be the most inspiring word Mm -hmm. because in some ways there might be some parts of your life where that focus comes naturally. What if you can kind of copy and paste that ability to other parts around you? Right, exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, I'm going to go to something that I was reading about you because you you, you told us why you got interested in this, but you were working in an unfulfilling career at at the time you decided to become an entrepreneur. And you said that you didn't, what was it? You didn't have any, you never assumed it to be difficult. Yeah, that was something. And to give kind of a little bit of the backstory, it it began as a fulfilling career. Uh, In fact, I was in line to get what I'd excuse me, perceived to be the dream job. And as soon as the offer was there, it was realizing I had another passion now that I wanted to follow. So for those that are curious, I was working in backstage production for theater. So not acting- I was just gonna ask you, what was the dream job? Yeah, it, okay. not, not, not acting, directing or designing. I was kind of the wizard behind the curtain calling cues and making all the actors get along mm-hmm. and burned out beautifully. By the way, it was gorgeous how <laughs> well, well I burned out inside of that. And here came again the dream job offer. But meanwhile, ever since that first sort of introduction to hypnosis, and then going off and taking courses, reading books, and uh, doing some of it, a bit of a part time career at the time. As soon as that offer was there, it was the, yeah, no, thank you. I didn't want to do it. The, the side story to this. And it'd be a mistake to hear what I'm about to say and say, that's good for you, but my situation is different. Mm -hmm. Because inside of what I'm about to mention was just a simple shift in perception in the fact that growing up, my parents were entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They were wedding photographers. One quit a job delivering plastics for a company. The other quit a job as a 
secretary for a well-known company that sells peanuts and the character has a monocle. I won't say which one it is though, but we've just called it out. I, I know. We know which <laughs> if, one. I know. Yeah. I mean, it's so, on my tongue, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, they, they had their own career. They Planters. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's plant some good ideas in people's mind here, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so there you go. So they, they started by doing their own thing about the same time that I was born. And even the surrounding family too. Here was my grandfather who owned at one point a furniture store and then a jewelry store, other family members too. So it created this premise where I grew up in a world where people could start their own business and that was normal. Mm. And I didn't realize this, and there's no negativity behind this next statement, though my wife comes from a family where everybody was an employee. And I noticed that dynamic of, oh, this is different. So so inside of this, though, here came that unknown superhero strength. The whole premise that we hear that, oh, it's kind of hard to start a business. It's going to be slow the first year. The statistics that most small businesses fail, I did not grow up seeing that. Mm -hmm. So okay. all that I all that I did see was my parents were wedding photographers and they seriously hustled to make that business run. They got out, they did the bridal shows, they did interviews and they got out and they spoke about what they did. And that's what packed that business. Mm -hmm. So this understanding that the one thing that makes things happen is action. Mm -hmm. So the idea that early on then, as it was time to launch my own business, it became everything necessary to go you know, instead of the question about who can I sell this to was instead, who do I need to put this in front of? So they see the value of what I do and that it's an obvious decision. I need to work with that guy. Right. Okay. So, you know, you were very blessed because, you know, you were surrounded by that. So you didn't have any fear of the unknown or anything like that, which most people do, especially if they're raised um, with, you know, their parents and their family and their friends and they're surrounded by corporate America. Right, right. Yes. So would something like that, would you be able to help somebody like that make the leap um, in the belief to, you know, they know they want to be an entrepreneur, but, you know, that hasn't been their environmental, you know, background. And so, you know, with, with something like that, would you be able to help with with something like that in their belief about stepping forward into this, knowing like intuitively they feel that it's right, but it's this you know, this wired brain of ours, it says, no, no, don't do that. You don't know anything about it. You, you know, it's scary. It's uncharted territories. I'd say that's probably one of the first footsteps into that, that initial foot in the door mm -hmm. that we can start to break down some of the reasons why people would stifle in their business early on. Mm -hmm. um, there's often the whole thing of imposter syndrome. Well, who am I to make this offer? Which a, a quick story around that, a student of mine, was looking at uh, several people in his marketplace and he goes, well, I talk about this approach to personal change, but so does this person, so does that person, so does this person. So why does there need to be another opportunity for this and why should they come to me? And in part of our consulting together, it became, well, the issue is that you may be saying some of the similar things that at the end of the day, a lot of us are, yet really what it comes back to is you don't fully understand that those are your stories. So I gave him the assignment just to go off more of a coaching exercise oh, to I go see. off and compile the things he had accomplished in his life. And he had done some pretty cool things. And all of a sudden the, the connection started to form there to realize here's why I'm the person who stands on the platform and tells the story here's exactly what comes from this experience where this guy dropped a hundred pounds a couple of years ago. And the moment that happened was also the moment where the business idea started to take off. And now it was the, you know, the nuts and bolts of making that occur. So it's where that might be part of imposter syndrome for some, there may be this negative relationship with money and that needs to be overcome. Mm -hmm. There may be, whether it's fear of failure or even sometimes fear of success, so to kind of identify where they are, and oftentimes a lot of what I tend to do is the fact that they know what they ought to be doing, yet all of a sudden, here's the idea of doing something like you and I are doing right now, just turning on the cameras, having a conversation. And it's that one part fear, but also one part lack of strategy about how do I now talk about what I do? Mm -hmm. How do I now present the value? So this is where combining some of those influential hypnotic language principles in, ter in terms of specific frameworks. So now we're speaking with intention 
Now there's a logical structure to what we're sharing. And now it follows that formula of inviting people in so they see the value and only then do we then follow up with the offer. Right. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense. And as I was following along, I was thinking to myself, you know, I I do believe everything happens for a reason and everything brings us closer to what we should be doing and our purpose. And, you know, I certainly had that when I was writing my first book, it took me eight years to write my first book because of that very reason. Cause I kept going back. You're not a writer. You didn't even graduate college. And, you know, I put the book down, but then there was a smaller, a small voice, a little flicker that kept saying, just keep going. And, you know, eventually, Actually, I ended up writing it. So, you know, but, and as you said, everybody rips off everybody there. I don't think there is an original thought, you know, but let's use, let's use more positive phrasing there. Perhaps we already hinted at this. It's uh, modeling excellence. (laughs) Modeling excellence. Okay. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Although for the sake though, make sure it's your own take on it. It's your own. That's just it. it. That's just it. It's not that, that what I wrote in my book has that it hasn't, it's not that it hasn't been said before, but mm-hmm. it hasn't been said before in my tongue. Because and I you know, think that's I've, one of those. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I've read so many books that have had the same kind of outline, same message, but ones I just can't, I can't get past five pages and the other ones I can't put down. So it is the way that it's written, which is, you know, you yourself coming through in all this, right? I even think to the example of someone who, you know, went through some of my material that mentioned people who may have similar approaches or even different schools of thought that have a similar end goal. Yet, as he put it, he goes, it was your story of doing this as a father of two kids, maintaining your health and using all of these things around you as every reason. He goes, when I read your story, He goes, I suddenly realized all the reasons why I was telling myself this is not the right time to do it. He goes, those were all the reasons you were presenting as to why you do what you do. That from the same intention, two different catalyst directions. And again, back to nature of the mind, it's what we focus on and what we create of it. Everything's an asset. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Okay. So um, what, what is your area of expertise with your clients? So most of what I do nowadays, uh, it began as seeing thousands of clients one-to-one, personal change as a hypnotist, helping people quit smoking, overcome fears, uh, weight loss, a lot of uh, working with a lot of athletes as well, and business owners too. The the story as to what I mostly do now is a funny one where, uh, again, I started to teach the business strategy as I was working. And I had a chiropractor come in as a client. She specialized in a specific form of chiropractic work that she wanted to break away from the insurance model, which then required she had to become more visible as an authority in her marketplace. So what was she going to do? She wrote a book. She was going out and giving presentations. So that was the sticking point because she had a fear of public speaking. Mm -hmm. So we worked on that fear. And yet the real turning point was that she came in like the second or third appointment and she had like a big stack of papers. And of course I'm thinking, what's that? She goes, well, it's my presentation. Okay. (laughs) She goes, I saw that video of yours from that convention in Vegas, where you were talking about how to open your presentation. So people stick around to the end. Could you look at this? I'm like, sure. And all of a sudden it clicked right away to go page three. There was this incredible story, but pages one and two were just, hi, I'm Dr. Johnson. Here's what I do. And I went to this school. I'm like, we need to switch that order open with that story, draw them in. The whole premise I now teach of invite your audience to care before you ever ask them to listen. Mm -hmm. Where now she opened with that story. She brought everybody in. It hit some really cool, genuine emotional tones. And only at that point, good morning, everybody. My name is this, and I help people with X, Y, and Z. So it's this four-step system that I guide people through now in terms of step one, emotional intelligence, how we carry ourselves, how we respond to the world around us. Step two, getting into calibration. How do we create that dynamic connection with other people? Step three, and as much as I'm the hypnotic language hacks guy, people are often surprised that it's not until the third step of the system do we then get into words and patterns. Because we first have to have that grounding within us. We have to have that connection with each other. 
so that now we can listen to what someone else's buying strategies are, how they make their decision structure in their mind, what their values are, which is where now we're matching up out of a couple of dozen different specific hypnotic language patterns. And then as I shared with the chiropractor story, getting into specific business applications. So yes, it's more on high ticket phone sales. Yes, it's how to sequence your videos, how to do business networking, how to ask for referrals. But the difference is doing it now with the secrets of hypnotic influence behind it. Yeah, and you see that your communica uh, the communication systems that you teach are focused on making sure that it's 100% mutual outcome. Yes. Tell us about that. Yeah. So it's always under the premise of ethical influence, positive persuasion, that at the end of it, everybody's happy with the outcome. The old phrase that anybody can sell something once mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. don't want to be in that world. So a simple principle of this is here's a strategy that anyone out there can start to use. I learned very early on, especially speaking from a platform or even in a one-to-one -one sales consult the power of making a vague outcome-based statement with a follow-up question, which that sounds highly technical. It's actually quite simple. Can you the give opposite, us an example? Yeah. So the opposite would be, I'm on the phone with an accountant a few weeks ago. And if I made the mistake of going, well, using these systems, you can probably book more clients, which to have actually listened to what his goals were, that was the opposite. He was servicing way too many clients and what he wanted to do was start to transition into more Fortune 500 companies. He wanted to work with more nonprofits. And he goes, I want to go from like maybe the 150 clients we have in my firm to maybe like 20. Now I'm partnering with another company, so we're not going to abandon these people, but my focus. So the power of the ambiguity, mm -hmm. as you consider these methods to get out there and share what you do. Mm -hmm. think about the changes that can make in your business. And he right. started nodding as you are right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the follow-up question was then, what would that be for you? So it's yeah. a slightly different way than just simply sitting down and following the standard rituals of, hey, Tina, what are your goals? But instead to involve that emotion, think about the changes that can create in your business. When I see he's responding to that idea, a follow-up question, what would that be for you? This is what's now going to inform me if one, my service can help him to do that, then we can follow along that route. Meanwhile, here was someone else the same week that as we got into it, he was at such an early startup phase that really to send him to the SBA, you know, to send him to some free resources out there to make that decision, whether he was is a counselor, whether he was an LLC or a PLLC or an S Corp. I'm like, they've got free information for that, which you could pay my big fee, you could buy my program uh, to go through and start to learn the languaging. But I think that's the next step. Also, right. this is a bit of a maybe for you right now. So by having what I call checkpoints in the sales process is where we can keep going as we see it's a fit and we can find a respectful way to bow out because in his situation, I go, well, you're not really in a place where you're ready to spend any money on this my program you know, does have a price tag to it. And I think for where you are right now, mm -hmm. use this free resource. And then once you have that up and running, let's schedule some time to come back together, which to have sold him something he wasn't ready for yet, it would have sat there like so many books that don't get read, so many online courses that aren't purchased, which I've done this pattern with people over the years before. And when they come back, now, here's the benefit for people who are afraid to refer out. The success that he'll likely have over there, he is also crediting and sharing that rapport of that, of that success back to me as I sent him there. Exactly. Which then reinforces the fact that now I'm at the point where it's time to jump into the Business Influence Systems program. You know, it's just, it's very simple because I think most people have been conditioned to um, get before they give. And yes. I, and I, what I'm hearing here is basically the same model. It's like, if you think and your intention is about giving first, then it's, it's, it's a natural thing to, to get. And, and just like when people are, let's say you're, you're trying to sell something, listen first. And I tell my clients this all the time, instead of going in there and, and trying to sell something or prove how much, you know, Nobody cares about that. There's that old yeah. saying. Remember the old saying, people don't care uh, how much you know unless they know that you care. It's basically the same idea, correct? 
Right. And, 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 and you're not trying to sell him on anything. It wasn't a good fit for him at the time. And if it, and so that's exactly what you mean by a hundred percent mutual outcome for both of you, not just, not just one-sided. Well, I think that's why for many people, sales and marketing often gets a bit of a bad rap. That's mm -hmm. it's too many people are, oh, let's go here, are metaphorically trying to consummate the sales marriage even before the first date. <laughs> when instead re recognize where you are in that engagement inside of the process where, you know, for example, uh, here's a person who was listening to my podcast, went to the website, scheduled time to talk with me. And yet in that consultation in that 30 minute call that we had was asking extremely specific questions about, Hey, you talked about this language pattern on this episode. Could I run one by you? And I went into that time just going, let's just workshop it. And uh, for anybody who loves to find clever objection crushers and fancy closing strategies, here's the one that I used. So you know about the program. What are your thoughts? Oh yeah, let me sign up. Okay, cool. I can take whatever card you want by phone. And that's as finessed as mm -hmm. it became. Mm -hmm. He was already at that mm -hmm. place of readiness where we're jumping in. And I, I had someone I was on the phone with recently who went off on this phrase that, yeah, but I'm really not much of a salesperson. And I got to jump in and go, well, as long as you say that garbage to yourself, that's going to be true. And if instead, yes, in terms of hypnotic language patterns, this could be considered what we call a reframe. Really, at the end of the day, what we're actually doing is educating and informing. Let, let's call something out here. People will listen to this podcast episode. And as it is with any book, any article, any podcast, some will listen for a bit and some will listen, all, let me use better language. Some will listen a bit, most will listen all the way through. And the people at the end, see how we made that transition? Mm -hmm. Most yep. at the end of that will then go, how do I find more like this? And it's where planted throughout this conversation are several options in terms of how to do that. So to let the process become much more organic. And again, I, I think the metaphor that really drives this home is a simple riddle. Why is it most people are not good at remembering names? And the answer is nothing to do with their memory. It's the fact that they weren't listening when they actually heard. No, no absolutely. Absolutely. No, <laughs> they were I mean, in their head going, what do I say to this person? What do I talk about? And they didn't actually hear it. Because so you're, ta just... uh, you're taking the whole person in. That, for right. me, that's what it is. I'm, I'm taking it. I'm very sensitive to energy. So I'm like taking, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm not even apologetic anymore. I just say, I mean, I am apologetic, but I'll say, please tell me your name again. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I didn't listen the first time. I'm just really honest about it because it's, it, it can be very embarrassing, but that's true. You, you so know, if anyone, uh, if anyone wants a shortcut for that, my wife and I had a trick for a bunch of years. She please. worked. She I am worked sure in, everybody wants the shortcut. Oh yeah. This, this, only, this only works with wingman. Uh, she worked in nonprofit fundraising. I had the theater career at one point and then also networking at conferences and uh, the term of the double tap if we were in public and we were with somebody and the internal dialogue was, I know I know this person, but I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. And behind the back and two little taps on the back and she'd go, he never introduces me. Hi, I'm Michelle. Oh, I love that one. And she yeah. would do it to me as well. So it was only fair. <laughs> I love that. You know what I usually do is I just would turn to whoever I'm with and, and kind of just with a hand, you know, and they would realize that it, I love that one, but you have yeah. to have you have a to have significant a wingman. other yes. to do that with. Yeah. Okay. You said a wingman. You have to have somebody that like knows about the tap unless you tell all your friends about Otherwise them. it's weird for both of them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> tell us about the three hypnotic language patterns that every business owner must know about. Yeah. So I mentioned already the idea of just simply reframing and building mm -hmm. a pattern around something. And let, let's start with a simple premise first. And this is more of a formula, first of all, than it is a specific pattern. Recognize One of the biggest questions I get is how do you handle objections? What do you do if someone has questions about pricing? What if they don't like the terms of something? And sales 101, satisfy objections before they arise. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the influential premise inside of this. Anything that's explained in advance is education. Anything that's explained after the fact is an excuse. So to start to look ahead of time and start to ask ourselves, what are some of those things we can more organically fold inside of what we do? So I'll give a quick example of one that I workshopped with a client a number of years ago. She had a specific service to basically go into big companies and kind of upgrade their HR principles. And she would go to HR companies, HR conventions, which were just as exciting as they sounded, apparently. She'd go to these <laughs> human resources conventions. I, 
Hang on. I've learned over the years, back when the focus was working with clients, public speakers, here's an important question. How dynamic does your presentation need to be? Because here's the passionate lobbyist who was raising money for foster care programs. That was a deeply emotional presentation. Here's the guy standing behind a lectern talking about groundwater contamination. Didn't need the showbiz. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah. she was talking, she was talking to uh, she was talking to HR companies. And the issue that she was running into was that when they heard what her presentation was about, they could easily go, I already do that. We don't need that. We already have that. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't even listen or they might not even attend the rest of this presentation. We kind of crafted this moment of what we call pre-framing, which uh, in this situation, the magic of a little phrase before we get started kind of led her to break that fourth wall of this conference presentation where the very first thing she did was she had the big title screen on the presentation and uh, good morning everybody hey before we get started let, let me just show you the outline of what we're about to talk about and she hit the button on the slide and there was this ugliest of a powerpoint page it was like nine bullet points what we should never do for powerpoint but it was ugly it was like aerial black font on white background nothing fancy she goes if you look at all the stuff, I mean, this is basically the outline of what I'm going to talk about. And it'd be easy for many of you to go, oh, we're already doing that and find a polite moment to sneak out. However, as I go through this, I'm going to be highlighting probably what you're already realizing are the best practices that are happening in your company. And then on top of that too, I'll show you a few tips and tricks of how to streamline this in such a way that can save your company a lot of money. So just as a heads up, what I've discovered is that when I give this presentation, a lot of people often start to smile as soon as I hit points that you're already doing, because that's where also realizing only like one or two nuances are going to be major game changers for your company. So let's have some fun. Here. So you've already made the connection. You've already, yes, instead of trying to get a connection and you've already brought out certain things that they can relate to the biggest and identify thing, with. The Pardon biggest me? thing too is that she overwrote the emotional reaction. She gave them the new emotional response as to when she hit something. The place where previously they would have gone, I already know this. Instead, she, they're now going, she, she laid it out there as a hypnotic suggestion. Many people, which that's a pattern called a non-specified referential index. Yeah, simplify, just use it. <laughs> Many right. people start to smile as soon as we hit this point because they're realizing you're already doing this. I'm just going to show you a few ways to do it in such a way that saves money. So now she wrote the emotional reaction for the people and what was the result? They were smiling when they hit those moments and got outstanding feedback on the presentation. A lot of people hired her company service. So recognize ahead of time, whatever would be those biggest conflicts, whatever would be those biggest objections that someone would have, the benefit now becomes if we frame it in advance, now it's education and now we can change that expectation as to what's going to be happening when they hear that. You got, you got time for two more? Yeah. Okay. So these next two kind of go together, uh -huh. which would be that the simple relationship of how the brain works. We learn through association. When I do this, I notice that. When this thing happens, that thing happens. Or even to give some more advanced strategies of this, the more that I exercise, the stronger that I feel which we already know that to be true, but we've now created a correlation that's logical. As I pay my taxes on time, I don't get angry letters from the IRS. Mm -hmm. As I published my book, a lot of new people found my service. As I took the live training that I've done for years and turned it into an online course, people around the world can make use of it on their own pace. So it's the ability to create cause and effect relationships in people's minds, mm -hmm. which sounds like it might be manipulation or influence, but again, recognize no matter what we're doing with communication, we're always influencing, we're yes. always persuading, yes. even if it's just simply suggesting, you know, what time we were going to meet today, uh, what software we were going to use to hop on a video call and record together. Mm -hmm. We're always influencing, so we might as well do it appropriately. So we can start to invent new cause and effect relationships as in, well, because we've scheduled this time together to meet, we can now begin to focus on the ways my company can help yours. Sound right. good? Yes, exactly. And now we've set that frame once again. That's why I started with that framing in advance, where as soon as we've said that, the brain absorbs that to be true because in technical part, it already is. And if we want to go a little bit more Jedi on this, 
we can start to repeat several true statements and then make a suggestion. Here's an example recently I did. This was someone who did credit repair that he goes, I'm in a crowded marketplace. Mine needs to be different. And this was something he put into a video. So even better, once it was produced, in the words of one of my heroes, Ron Popeil, with his Showtime rotisserie grill, set it and forget it. <laughs> this yeah. video is now on the website and he just calls out some statements that are already true about credit repair to then make a suggestion. If I remember it right, it was, well, you've probably been looking at a lot of different services for credit repair. And to be honest, you probably didn't want to get into this type of situation. And now you're looking at the bills coming in and realizing that there's immediacy to this, which is why in my presentation today, I'm gonna to show you three things you can do immediately, even before you make use of my service to start to get that score moving back up. So you've identified their pain point and that's yeah. what gets their interest. Now in that it worked as a video because as we talk in business, figure out that custom client avatar because he was talking to one specific audience mm -hmm. and he had been doing it in person for a bunch of years, he already knew some of those nuances, some of those specific pain points, so he could work from an assumption. If it was one-to-one, -one, start by asking questions, then we get those specifics. The, the right. leveled up version of the cause and effect, this one's my favorite, mm -hmm. is that of what we call a complex equivalence. And the simplicity of this is it's almost like a cause and effect, but the difference is one piece of information now becomes the meaning of another piece of information. And I'll share with you the one that I use almost everywhere that I possibly can. It's, let's say it's a 10 minute video that's on the jasonlinette.com website. And about the seven or eight minute mark, I might drop the phrase, and let me just call this out. The fact that you're still watching this presentation clearly means that you're fascinated by these language patterns. And perhaps you're already thinking about where you can put this into your business. So the sequence was the fact that X is occurring means that Y. And, and I'll give you a specific example of this one, which got a really cool impact. And this is a great example, especially for people who might be in a startup phase. Mm -hmm. I had someone who joined the Business Influence Systems program who is a contractor, and he used to work for another bigger company, and they retired. They just closed down the family business, and now he's kind of on his own, which he does have the benefit of having some of those old clients, but it didn't make sense to carry the name of the family and he now run it. He wanted to start his own thing, which let him do that. So the result was other companies were showing up higher in the search results. He wasn't paying for advertising like on Facebook, Yelp, Angie's List. So he was kind of a new name, even though he was really skilled and really well established in what he did. So what he discovered, and again, this could be for someone else, every reason why, oh no, this isn't gonna go well. We turn this into an asset. By the time people were on the phone with him, they had already picked up like three or four different estimates. So he was able to utilize that fact to become someone who was different. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, great. Well, the benefit is here, the fact that you've already got all those estimates probably means that problem is still there in your home he went for the double whammy. The fact that you have all those estimates means that problem is probably still there in your home, which also likely means you're getting a little bit more anxious to get this thing taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, before we even talk about the details, just as a heads up, I've got availability next week, Monday and Tuesday, but we'll get to that later. Tell me more about the repair. He had injected. I, I had injected yeah, you know, I, I read somewhere in your press uh, kit, you know, the question of, is this um, manipulation? Is this manipulating somebody? But it, it it's not manipulating, it's organizing your communication to, I mean, somebody's not gonna buy something. Well, that's not true. I was gonna say somebody's not gonna buy something that they don't need. So this is not manipulation. It is just a way of formulating and organizing so you can communicate more efficiently. Yeah, I'd say I, I kind of had a turning point about two or three years ago where the idea was to take again, a live training or private service that I've been doing for years and turn it into an online course with an online community. This way it can reach more people. And the turning point was to simply realize the confidence builder for someone is outside of the jargon in terms of what we call some of these techniques, outside of sometimes giving something a funny name, 
you know, I don't, oh, hang on. I don't teach people how to get better testimonials. Oh, no, no, my friends. It's the raving fan machine. Same thing, just with a better name. <laughs> oh, okay. But it's at the end of the day, though. So other than the jargon, other than the terminology, which is more our side of the knowledge of that's what this is, that's what that is. For the most part, those of you out there with a business, you're going to be using the same words and saying the same things you would have said anyway, but by putting the right words in the right order, order. Yeah, you can that's... better. I mean, back to the theater career, there's a specific moment that I learned so much. And as, as uncomfortable as this was with, let me generalize this to not call it specific people because they might have better lawyers than I do. Uh, this was a Tony award-winning lighting designer mm -hmm. who in front of like 80 people, actors, musicians in the orchestra, stage hands, lighting crew, everybody in the technical rehearsal got fired beautifully. I mean, it was painful, I'm sure for him, but and kind of deserved to be fired, which was that this was a big, funny musical. So wherever your brain goes when I say something big and funny, um, you know, like Music Man or the producers, it's not a drama, it's the big, funny musical. And he was lighting it like it was a drama. I mean, if you walked in the room and looked at the stage, it looked like he was lighting a horror movie. And the director kept going, comedy, comedy, <laughs> comedy, brighter, brighter, and just got fired. And eventually, we never actually replaced the lighting designer. The, uh, the electrical engineer of the space just went in and goes, just put all the lights on 100%. How's that? And the director goes, perfect. <laughs> so the tone, they, they were lighting with the wrong tone. Mm -hmm. The same as, um, you know, there's a magician that I knew a number of years ago that he would perform as himself. But then he also had this, this kind of dark comedy act where he had like eyeliner and the whole thing was done tongue in cheek. Yet it wouldn't work if he put on the eye makeup and the dark costume and then went off and did the kid's birthday party. Right. So recognize that, again, back to the story of the HR person, sort of setting that frame in advance, we can put the right words in the right order because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, with the right words at the right time, we can inspire the right pictures, the right representations, the right feelings within the other person. So now they're seeing the value. Now, even better, let's get them a few small wins, even before we ask them to make the buy, the way that I'm sure people have read your book. Yeah. They say, I like what she had to say. They maybe found this podcast, then they reached out and they hired you. Mm -hmm. The same as people listen to this, they check out the Hypnotic Language Hacks podcast, they watch some of the other videos and they go, oh, I can join this thing. So yeah. let's build that logical through line for people. And again, at the end of the day, we're using a lot of the same words we already know. It's the sequencing that really changes, like the story of the chiropractor. Opening with the story changed everything. Let me ask you, okay, so it sounds to me, if I'm going to summarize this, there's that you, we, we just talked about the effective communication and the, or, you know, the order that, that you place your, your words. But then we, when we first started the interview, we were talking about um, beliefs, mm -hmm. you know, and that's when I, when I first think of, uh, you know, hypnotherapy or a hypnotist, it's like, they're going to change my belief system. So working mm -hmm. with you, would it be fair to say that you, you do both? You not only help them maybe with their subconscious mind and replacing negative self-limiting beliefs with empowering ones and, and then also help them with the order of their words to make communication more effective and more of a positive, uh, 100% mutual outcome for both people. Yeah. And it's possible to do this in both the one-to-one, -one, like I do consulting. And then also here's a program version of it where in step one, remember back, I mentioned that was emotional intelligence. Yes. And let's take the moment for looking at, um, what is it? I, I meet some people who go, well, it's kind of going to be hard to start a business because I just sometimes have those days. And this is without any sort of clinical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. This is out without any sort of big header words to describe this issue. Any of us, we have those days where we are all systems go, we are feeling fantastic, and there are some days where we're just kind of getting through it. The Even same you? as any, anyone, well, we're about to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyone, who, anyone who exercises, um, this is my moment of fun with words. There was a time that uh, to rehab a bad back, I got into strength training. I love the metaphors that come out of weightlifting where not every day is going to be a PR, but sometimes it just is that little bit of an incremental improvement. And even sometimes 
the specificity. I'm, I'm only five foot four. Mm -hmm. So I just gave up on like exercise machines because I'm convinced they're all built for someone who's five foot 10 and learning how to use like barbells, dumbbells, free weights requires more specificity and technicality towards how you do it. And it's how sometimes I think of one time we're just learning how to breathe appropriately while doing a squat with a barbell, you know, oh, if I breathe here and I exhale there, that specificity changed everything. So we have those days where even in the gym or even working out on our own, we are feeling it. And some days it's effort as I forget who it was who said in the weight industry, he goes, sometimes the weights are heavy. Mm -hmm. I love that as a mm -hmm. statement, mm -hmm. Martin Birkin. And so the idea in terms of that state management, we can start to, we can either go after changing the belief system verbally or even better, give someone a strategy so that they can do it and change that result, which then it's not a matter of belief or disbelief. Now they've got the fact, oh, I know what to do now. So part of this is, and you've studied some of NLP. I that, see what you're saying. So as a principle, by understanding yeah. how it all works, then, okay. Yeah, keep or the, I, I'd say the better question, so many people get caught up in the question of, well, why do I feel this way today? And I, th or why do I do this habit? Why do I have this fear? When the more empowering question is to ask, how can I change it? I, I make it a habit Ooh. to go back and reread books that I've found to be beneficial over the years. And just last night started to reread Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. Oh opening, my God. And yeah. In the, and in the, it's like, it's the third or fourth time now. I've read and all in the opening, books. And in the opening chapter, there's the correlation between one goes, I can't afford that. And the other goes, how can I afford that? Yeah. Which I love that as a premise. And I wish I heard that earlier. Uh, so let's use this example of the good day versus the bad day, where if someone learns a strategy of instead of accepting that as fact, mm -hmm. as instead of accepting that as gospel instead, well, how do I change that? So there's a principle you might be familiar with already called anchoring, mm -hmm. which uh, let's use a simple story that most everyone knows. Doctor by the name of Ivan Pavlov. Mm -hmm. rings a bell, feeds his dogs, rings mm -hmm. a bell, feeds his dogs, rings a bell, feeds his dogs, rings the bell. The dogs expect food. They call that conditioning. We call that anchoring. And th mm -hmm. this is something we all do on our own all the time. You hear a song on the radio and suddenly it brings about all the memories of what you were going through when mm -hmm. you first heard that song. You walk into a room, you smell lemons and maybe it's cleaning supplies, maybe it's specific food. So the mind, again, back to cause and effect. Mm -hmm. creating these correlations. So the strategy that I say is start with the solution. Mm -hmm. When you recognize these moments where you are effective, when you recognize these moments where things are connecting, you're saying the right things to the client, they're responsive, you make the offer and they're already signed up for it and they're ready to go. The same as those of us who do video, uh, people often see my videos and they go, you do these like 35 minute takes without cutting. How do you do that? And the answer is you only, you only see the last take. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but as soon as I get the right one there, I'll tell you exactly what I do. As soon as the sale comes in on the website, as soon as the client books with me, even as soon as the client gets a result, as soon as I finish the good take of the video, it's a very specific clap that I've conditioned to which now mm. the phone is ringing the Zoom is waiting to connect. And as soon as I hit the button and I'm back in that zone. And how do we make- So that towards... signals to your brain when you do that clap, that that's something like positive that you want more of? That's me ringing the bell and the puppy's hungry once again. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and the benefit of this is anchoring, it can be done with anything that's sensory verifiable. So I mentioned working with public speakers, a lot of them that I've worked with, it may not be appropriate to do the clap. It may not be appropriate to fire off a specific word, which is also an option. Mm -hmm. A lot of the public speakers I've worked with, it's just this little shift of posture that now I'm in that production mode and it's time now to speak and they're back into it. The actor, Jack Lemmon, who, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. odd couple and mm -hmm. uh, angry oh, old course. man, Walter Matthau, there's a story about him that the director would yell action and Jack Lemmon would say magic time. And I think it was the TV movie of the book T Tuesdays with Maury, oh, uh, where he was I in love that, that book. Yeah. And he was in that movie. I think the actor was Hank Azaria, you know, like Apu from The Simpsons, and, uh, but amazing actor. And yeah. he goes, it was one of the greatest acting challenges of my life because I'm there with this legend 
but also we would have to do this deeply emotional scene and the director would be matching the tone action jack lemon would go magic time <laughs> so he did this too so we can do this on purpose the metaphor that i give you is that of stacking it so it's yeah. something that we start to build up it's something that we are increasing one the neurological structure that now that emotional state is attached to that thing but then on top of that why does that work so well for me and many people i've taught this to because they know it's going to work for them because they yeah. have that full, not just belief, but conviction because they've created it on purpose. You know, it, it, uh, timing is so, so relevant to so many things. And I was just listening to James Clear's uh, Atomic Habits. Have you read yeah. that book? Oh, yeah. He's talking about the same thing about stacking, stacking today. And mm -hmm. when you're trying to change a habit or whatever, and um, very interesting, very interesting. So tell us a little bit about your podcast. It's called Hypnotic language hacks, correct? Yeah. So hypnotic language hacks, it's a mixture of interviews, but also just kind of, again, peeling back the curtain and teaching specific strategies that people can put into use right away in any type of business. That's the fun of this for me mm -hmm. is that at the beginning of it, it's all the same basic patterns and principles. Even if I show my video influence system, which is seven steps for a video, the way that I've seen my students over the years modify that for public speaking, modify that as a dentist, modify that as an accountant. So anywhere you can find podcast, do a search for hypnotic language hacks okay. and you'll find it. Also that does release to YouTube as well. So we do video too. So just simply do a search for hypnotic but, language yeah, hacks. Yeah, that's what I do that. too. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, I'm just thinking to myself, I mean, we've been talking all about business people and entrepreneurs, but which are business people too, but yes. um, uh, but I'm thinking this could this could help in somebody in in communicating in a romantic relationship, friendships, family situations, right? I mean, because it's all about you know what they say. What it's not what you say, it's how you say it, or or the in this case of uh, the organization of how you say it, correct? Yeah, and there's a story that comes to mind here, which again, all communication is influential. It's a matter of how it's put into use. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyone who heard your question, I know it's not what you intended, but I always want to inoculate this one, that clearly mutual positive outcome, we're not talking about the person who claims to be, notice that frame, mm -hmm. uh, claims to be a pickup artist and just tell stories. And mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, that aside, uh, I had someone a while ago that uh, this is a story that I taught about how I entered into a market. This goes back to like 2007, 2008, where I wanted to do more presentations, a uh, talk that I did for schools. Mm -hmm. And I found, and again, the goal first was what can I give rather than what can I sell? And I wanted to not be, the phrase I live by is be the expert, not the vendor. So I found here was the magazine mm -hmm. that if you're a high school principal, you get this magazine. You don't even have to subscribe to it. You just get it. So I called them up, got the editor on the phone. Easy phone number was there. And I, she answered right away. Hey, I saw this. I do programs for schools. And you know, a lot of the principals that I talk to run into this problem, but they also run into that problem. I've got these two talks that I give that I'd love to turn into an article. Of these two, which one do you think would be the best fit for your readers? Which that's what we so like. Already the assumption that they're, that they're going to read it. Yeah. That's what we call a double bind. And it's option A, option B. Okay, where do I sign up? <laughs> yeah, leaving out, option, leaving out option C as in who the hell are you and why do we want this? So right. that was the assumptive close. And they immediately latched on to, oh, this one would be perfect. We were just talking about that. How soon can you get that? We go to print on Monday and it's Thursday. I'm like, I can take care of that. Clear the rest of the day, wrote the article, got it edited <laughs> yeah. and sent it over. And immediately the rest of that story, here came this proof. Here came this piece of evidence, this asset and I ask myself, who else needs to see this? So a couple of thousand color copies of that individually dropped into envelopes, mailed to all the principals with the cover letter. I'm sure you already saw this, but here's an extra copy just in case. By the way, here's what I do. And that's what launched my business in the first phase. So this premise of the either or, I had a, uh, she was the therapist and her issue was, and she was off the insurance model. And she had the issue of, she goes, people are kind of used to the insurance model. And what I do is something kind of outside of that, which is why I'm now, she's now calling herself a coach as many are making that transition too, mm -hmm. where the issue was people wanted to book single pro single sessions. She wanted to sell a bigger package. Mm -hmm. 
And she used to hide the single session option uh, because she goes, well, I don't want to sell that. But there's a way that I talk about how do we put the influence on one and put the weakening statements on the other in such a way that now we're putting the emphasis in here. Well, some people do this. However, what most people do is that because you'll see over time it actually you know, helps you to get there faster and saves you some money. So as soon as she did that, she, she called this out and I learned this from her. She goes, as soon as I stopped asking the binary question as to do you wanna work with me, yes or no, it now became, which program do I choose? And she goes, I've got a problem. They're all booking with me. Now, later that week, this goes to your statement there. She goes, I'm dealing with my teenager. And it was the game of, we really needed him to clean the room. There's just, here's his room. Well, that was I got to listen to this story. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And my son's pretty good about that. Which our kids are now seven and nine. I'll give you my personal variation oh, yeah. of this in a moment. That she basically turned it into, there was something that she knew he wanted to do that uh, I, I forget exactly what it was. Let's assume it was video game or whatever. Um, and it was, hey, do you want to clean your room before dinner? That way you can really play the game tonight. Or do you want to clean your room after dinner so you can really enjoy the game? She gave him two options, both of which included clean your damn room. And right. he did it. Um, my version of this is that again, back to reframing, uh, we have been out to eat at restaurants and people are watching us at that time. Uh, my kids are now seven and nine. And at the time they were maybe four and six. Mm. And these were the kids who were devouring every bit of their vegetables at the meal and just the, the look on people's faces. And it's where at home, you know, recognize when people are going through the process for the first time is the theme of the story. But in our household, we are fancy with our dinners because fancy restaurants do courses. And after you have the first course, now you can have this. So as others were barking and yelling at their kids to eat their vegetables instead, Here's what it meant. As soon as you finish this course, you can have that one. And even now we can put all the food on the plate and they go in that order, which- um, I, That's how my parents got me to eat everything. Yeah. And to try everything too. The only mm -hmm. thing, the only two things, honestly, when I was growing up that I, and I still to this day don't like is, is liver and lima beans. Probably well, actually could like lima beans, but uh, you know, out of well, everything. to be fair, one of those is disgusting, but the other one has no flavor. So, yeah. um, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> um, so let me ask you, so, you know, I'm thinking about this because you, when you hear hypnotist, hypnotherapist, um, you think about somebody going under, but you're really mm -hmm. a coach. I mean, you're, I mean, for all intent and purposes, you you are coaching people on how to, how to do this, correct? Yeah. And th there's a couple of quick points inside of that, that uh, first of all, in terms of hypnotist versus hypnotherapist, and this is a conversation and one part of what I do that I get to talk about this over and over as the there's different hypnosis is sort of run by private organizations. The origin of the modern hypnotist goes back to a stage hypnotist, actually, that two doctors were knocking on his door going, could you teach us medical hypnosis? Mm -hmm. And he responded, I don't know what that is. I do entertainment. And they go, we know. We learned a medical version of hypnosis, which was really slow, really long and drawn out. But we just watched you hypnotize 20 people in 90 seconds. You teach us the methods of hypnosis. We'll figure out the medical applications. And that began the legacy of the non-medical professional in the hypnotic industry, where there are wow. some psychologists and counselors who also make use of hypnosis. Um, I help to not just train but also now qualify other practitioners to become instructors. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. yeah. For one of the bigger organizations that's called the ICBCH, the International Certification Board of Clinical Hypnotherapists. What's great about this specific group is that it's really inclusive. There are some that are counselors, therapists practicing with licenses. And the majority though, are folks like me that came from a different background and learned it as a trade, learned it as a skill. And as I mentioned earlier, when you brought up ADD, I'm always drawing that line as to here's what I do, here's the role that I don't serve and mm -hmm. where I often make a referral. So really, really the two words, hypnotist and hypnotherapist tend to be interchangeable for anybody who really cares for the extreme details. It's really more of a legislative thing here in the US about certain states, the word therapist is protected. So it's really a dialogue that's more to do with the word therapy and very little to do with the word hypnosis. The bigger picture that I tell my hypnosis students would be that uh, more people are Googling hypnotist. So bow down to the gods of Google if you want to have people find you.
<laughs> Instead of the, hypnotherapy. Yeah. Right. So I, I call it as what it is, but there's a presentation though. And this is where the intention to start to peel back the curtain and not just do the work, but also teach people in business how it occurred was in the presentation. I mentioned the program I used to do for schools, which then became the program that I did for corporate audiences, mm -hmm. which fun fact, it was the same presentation. We just changed the soundtrack. We just changed the music. Mm -hmm. Same yep. thing, different yep. audience. Mm -hmm. There was a moment, and it, like you mentioned the idea that they're, to use the medical terminology, they are zonked out and they look like yogurt splattered in a chair in a puddle of relaxation and they remember nothing. That's kind of the science fiction expectation. There was a moment I put into the presentation, which was completely built to debunk that expectation. I would get a guy to stand up. We would talk for a moment. I would have him extend his arm out in front of him and squeeze his hand, squeeze his hand into a fist and look at his arm. And throughout this entire demo, we were talking, we were interacting, except I kept describing how his arm was getting stronger and stronger. And the kicker moment was to go, but you can hear everything I'm saying, right? Yeah, but check this out. The more you try to bend your arm, it gets even more solid because you can't bend it now. And he couldn't. And, and the whole moment was kind of, I, I illustrated this as when you see the TV news anchor, the reporter out in the field interviewing somebody and like a hundred feet behind, there's some kids playing around in the background. That was sort of the theatrical structure I wanted to build at this moment where, as I thought, I go, let me just talk about how this works. And in that moment, I was explaining all the language patterns and the whole play-by-play -play of this comedy you were bit. Actually, okay, I see what you're, okay, yeah. so you were actually implementing it as you were, you were speaking to him without, yeah, yeah, him, the, no, without him really knowing it. And the setup of it was, once we got the result, I go, but you can see everything that's happening, right? Yeah, try to bend the arm. What does that feel like? Like a steel bar. Though you can hear me, right? You know, it's funny because some people think when they're in hypnosis, they can't hear, but you can hear me, right? Yeah. And right. you're aware of the entire audience too, right? right? Try to bend that arm. What does it feel like? And just to have, this is the funny part, just to have some words to fill in the gaps, I started to just explain the language that I was using to make that happen. Well, if you rewind it back, there was a moment where I stopped talking about your arm and I started to talk about that arm. The moment I did that, you started to dissociate. And because you've been able to bend your arm your entire life, but now when I say try to bend that thing, that thing is something external. And that was part of where your mind accepted the, that the suggestion. The word that as opposed to yours. Which right there, there's a personal change strategy. Stop saying this is my fear. It's that fear that I've sometimes had to deal with in the past. Change your words, change your business, change your life. Change your life. I was just going to say, you <laughs> took the words right out of my mouth. All so right. what, was hap what was happening though, was that people were coming up after the presentation going, wait, explain that again. And I talked through it and it still worked. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I was seeing the fascination that people in business had around, again, the language structure behind this, which is where what was at one point just a business influence course became now the online program and community business influence systems, which is breaking down these four steps that I've talked about and giving specific applications of how to put it together too. So it's a great little lesson of what I thought my audience wanted very clearly, they wanted something else, and you just have to listen and deliver that. Exactly, exactly. So you do individual and you do group, correct? Yeah, and, and I'd point to jasonlinette.com, which I'll right. spell the name. It's uh, one N, two Ts, no extra letters at the end, though. Tina, you'll love this as someone who does a lot of stuff online. I own all of the misspellings. Uh, they'll just point to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know, I'm looking at my notes here. You have a free training on how, how it works on yes. your website, correct? Yes. So okay. if you're at jasonlinette.com, at uh -huh. the top, click over to the page about the program I've referenced, Business Influence Systems. And yep. that's going to bring you through a free training video. Okay. I, I've mentioned the video influence process. In okay. the process of introducing that program, it's just going to teach you that seven-step formula for videos. Oh, okay. uh, which that'll show you a method you can put into use right away. Fantastic. Well, this is fascinating. You're certainly going to get a call from me. Um, I, I think I, I completely believe everything that you're saying. I mean, you know, I have my master's in metaphysics. Your thoughts are things they, you know, and, and, and that becomes your reality. And so if you don't like the way your reality is looking and you want to further it, you know, that's what you've got to change. And you've got, um, you, this is your area of expertise. So I, uh, 
I think this is, this is amazing. And we've already talked about your podcast. So um, I'm sure that we'll probably have you on again sometime. Oh, I'd love to. And come on and even walk through one of the specific methods. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I would love that. And uh, you know what? Maybe after I take your, yeah, I don't know if it's going to, I mean, I, I'm thinking more one-on-one if I do that, then I can come on and actually talk from experience. Oh, sure. We'll chat further on that. That'd be fun. Okay. Well, thank you for watching another episode of Transparent with Tina. Please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you have not done that yet. It's Tina Marks TV, and you can find this podcast, Transparent with Tina, on just about every platform. Um, if you need to email me, it's Tina Marks TV at gmail.com, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in.